chronic physical illness, um, addiction and illness, whether it's ours, our speakers, people in our lives, um, and the, the readers will get into that. So I'm going to first open with our the, the bios of our first readers. So just a little bit of a layout. We'll do bio, so bio, reader, bio, reader. I'll do some questions for our panelists, and then um, if we have time at the end, we'll open it up to you all to ask the questions. So our first reader, readers for today, they come in a pair, um, two for one special. Um, it's Adele, Elise, Williams, and Henry Gold. So Adele, Elise, Williams, and Henry, oh yeah, clap for them. Yes. You made it, you guys exist, it's exciting. <laughs> um, Adele, Elise, Williams, and Henry Goldcamp are poets and friends, writing from Houston and New Orleans, respectively. Williams acts as the nonfiction editor for Gulf Coast. Goldcamp reads poems for Tilted House between the two of them. Their poems have recently appeared in the Georgia Review, Crazy Horse, Guernica, Indiana Review, Denver Quarterly, Cream City Review, and Tiger Quarterly, among others. Together, they are at work on an experimental treatise on High, which examines cross currents between addiction and Christianity. Thank you for being here. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. China white ain't my passport. I fly far, like vermin in a rat trap, a needle I need. Get your bags, cut the line, no class. The ticket's in the line, so step on up. Carry on, day trippers, all board. Cop some tar. Peep spots and things. Hey, how you doing? Hey, I'm good. I know. Hey, you seen Skid around? See any fat pockets? Hey, now that Scooby pushed me on Main, should be with it. Hey, do I look like a pussy? Like I dose for fun? Dude. Dope. <laughs> Step two. Drag off a cerise camel. Soon to nod, slob. Night, a pyramid scheme, the slight palms, middlemen runneth over, fancy fish out of the rib kit, dope, but the night and its lover, like super duper over the dune about it. Grab your spoon. Up. Let me go on. Bible, Bible idiot, idiot, bird, motto, ethos. <laughs> Step three. Everything in the world asks for a blaze. Fervid pond scum, thirsty jerks, extinguished members of the conflagration. Pet me, bloodsucker. Now burn. Blick, thick. Leech, extra, extra atar, atar, craze, harem. Step four. The breakfast of champions, scuzzy field stars, pornographers both. Black butter on a biscuit. Cats and yammer, flapjacks, hot brown juice. Cooks often cook. So polish your plate. Snap, crackle, lop. <laughs> your mama looked like a dogma, other, ghost, mesos, artsy. Step five. Traded gold chain to my guy for tooth and cheese, cheddar churns in the neighborhood's weepy wrist, half doctor, half killer, 100% insured, 
Rig sucks. I don't believe in no. Demon, edema, meets, omega, nasal. Step six. Gold breakers. Catfishers. Divine rods. Black's hot. Recumbency. Pleasures plenum. Cool. <laughs> bang, bang. <laughs> Head full of moonbeams, pocket full of crack. crack. Rava, aloof, cloak, Kafka. <laughs> Step seven. My guy forgets brown out, black out, white out. Oh, not age. Fentanyl. You gone. You owe me a grand ruler, alive, nebulous dress. Step eight. Eternity? Very eternity. Probity? Negative. Two by two? Four by four. I live a riff of math. Math was my only regret. My bread in agrestic rhapsody. My pack pockets fat with nicks, dimes. But my IV low key is an emperor's. Baby, I was gas out of Bond's bag. Gas in a bag trying to get my car to go. Can you spot some love tonight? Or can? Or can't you? B O G to die and then live again. Al Anon and Abaddon. Mainline, sticky slip, go, guy, go. Even dogs know how to lie, and everyone loves dogs. Respect the lies, my plain dead. Mom calls crying, says don't quit before the miracle happens. Addict, die that. Step down. Okay. Let her rip, aromatic. R, I. Thank you. Thank you. Falling. 
Salah, my second eldest brother, Air Force man after graduating Joseph S. Clark High School, landed in North African desert, serving America, the free world, returned home to New Orleans to marry his sweetheart in a double wedding, two sisters, twins each, with four bridesmaids and groomsmen. Twins were rare in those days, before assisted DNA brought multiple births common. Mim, who sewed new dresses for every socially pleasured dance and winter ball, whether it's cowboy or cowgirl, or black Creole society women now married, and moms raising bundles of love girls and boys, many deaths. Once Hurricane Katrina passed, levees broke, drowned our beloved neighborhoods to brown, stale dust beds of mold, empty corner stores, and all went from initial post-Katrina evacuation when there was no place to live. To more solid resettling in other Louisiana parks where apartments available became new homes. At the mall with wife Mim, who loves to shop, had a rare black wife who raised their five kids herself at home. Didn't have to work since Sawa worked nights, then college by day to advance at post office levels to make more than his early paycheck that once Bill paid and left only enough to buy shoes for the family. Educate five, now all grown. That simple there's a typo, ended in a fall. <laughs> that simple outing, ended in a fall, caused three brain surgeries, each more scary than the other. He kept smiling, though he could no longer plant tomatoes or lettuce or melly toss, sweet potatoes. Sawa makes 90 this summer. Reminds me that neighborhood families I miss from arsenals to tutorials. Swears he forgets stuff, but relishes all the days we live. Me, an athlete, swimmer mostly, fell skating at 13 at Corpus Christi Gym, where we skated to the latest rhythm and blues from Aretha to James Brown. The worst I remember is my eighth grade graduation photo from Epiphany Catholic School. Me, we, all in white dresses, mine and linen with embroidered app appliques down one side. This February, the cold switched to heat and exploded tree power, that's acting folks, a full-on allergy war called Welcome to Spring Deserts. Coupled with a fever meant COVID kissed me sick as a mangy dog. Dizzy, fatigued, weak, turned into fainting spells for days. One fall broke my arm in three places, hurt my hell. Forecast in eight weeks, still pain, but worse than not being able to drive or not able to reach an open door or open a jar is not being able to cut up celery and onions for tuna, or to whip up my holy trinity to prep for a pot of red beans, or grab my cast iron pot for stir fries, not to mention the two months of fall from falling even once while singing in the gospel choir at St. Raymond St. Leo the Great. Such blackouts <coughs> eclipse daily life. I miss peeling an avocado or cutting lettuce, onion, celery, the jewels of the holy trinity of root, the creamy base to every aged bait or gumbo or green eye. After escaping COVID 2.5 years, it kissed me this February, had to cut my kinky hair glory to enable combing my hair with one hand. Well, I miss clapping and stabbing my fingers loudly. Opening a jar becomes a near miracle. It reminds us not to take one day for granted, our gift, a present from God. <laughs> Stole everything not nailed down. Didn't leave daddy a pair of shoes. 
I had to draw around his feet on cardboard the sizing. The shoe store clerk wanted security to remove me until I stood my ground and left with a tan pair of barrages and slippers for Danny. Doctors thought Danny deaf and deteriorating from dementia, but he just closed his ears and leaking eyes to the disappointment he saw in his stepkids and the transient men who took over his home. His life with no hot running water, a broken toilet, the weeds growing through the bathroom floor from the dirty ground four feet below the clawfoot iron tub leaning through the broken floorboards rotten from neglect. It took me two years in and out of court to get rid of those niggas. It was the filth and poor nutrition on top of it that diminished this World War II Army sergeant, master carpenter, into a man who babbled, slobbered, who forgot who he knew, my dad. We used to dance with my mother and shut oysters at her backyard parties growing up. I had no idea what I walked into. Just rolled his 300 pound body in sheets to clean him and changed bed linens until the shower was installed. His first shower since his army days, he sang. He was happy again and came back to himself fully for years, returning to stand guard on the front porch and greet family and neighbors, or what we call dope hopping, talk stuff about passers by. Even his doctors were shocked. We all knew it was only God in the mind prayers. My new college co colleagues, friends, and professors, now friends, came and ate Buster's Poirines and Andrew's Bananas Buster Bread Pudding with us, and danced a second line with us on Dual Street at 82 or all laughing faces in tune to the birds. I'm a Joe Casanova. <laughs> <laughs> Me and Romeo ain't never been friends. Can't you see how much I really love you? Gonna say it to you time and time again. Oh, Casanova. They thought my family was celebrating my degree. My cousin Larry said this backyard bash took him to our old parties that everybody came for me, not for a wedding or a funeral. Big, big, nobody got married and nobody died. They came for me for watching me love Daddy back to help. Back to himself, back to our friends. And yes, the PhD of family first, bringing us all together the way we were all raised. Only God, he said, only God. Sakata sang through the evening, serenading the nights until stopped only days later for Hurricane Katrina, fanned across the Gulf. That was our family's last time all together with long term elders, Moonshot Jazz crewmen, the fishnet making layoffs, and great gumbo series no longer here. I told my family, maybe I'll write a novel about those hard days of waking up to a strawberry crackhead horror, peering over the African beads on my dresser, and daddy with no shoes. I'll change the names to protect the guilty. <clears throat> it was hotter and more humid years ago. The last time our family was all together, when nobody died and no one was married. I am a child casting no over. Thank you. <laughs> These poems um, alternate between uh, states of depression and uh, mania. <laughs> and you guys know it said peonies, I'm going to read my peonies come first. <laughs> peonies. In my neighbor's yard, wild maned jasmine creeps over the chain links, drips syrupy sweet, morning dew on upturned cheeks. I want to lick the moisture from each petal. For part of each day, I am happy. I watch the roses shout over each other near the yard's edge. Geraniums foam from flower boxes dribble into corners. Soon the grass will tilt and I will slide off the rim. The sky flips over to sun its other side. Somewhere, someone else Pinches the head of grief, twists the body, sucks it dry. No. What I want to write about is peonies. I have yet to make mine grow. Uh, this one, oh, thank you. Um, this one is called On the Third Day of the Week. 
steady humdrum as if peeking from the rim of an AR-15. Clack, clack, clack in the snares. Cadence is fucking the world flimsy. I ought to peel you back and expose the pink in you. My serrated roar, loud enough to burst holes in your aliveness, and the ceiling slips a leg out. The walls cinch their corsets tighter. The stove opens its maroon mouth, and I sift the pilot light. The room pitching like a submarine to strike. The seething light now, an abscess to fa la 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 line in me. In me, a savannah of soot. Me, the last pigeon roosting in St. Peter's Cathedral, careening as the gun blows the windows and the sky licks its underside and the earth twitches a teeny bit further towards the sun. of eyelashes, the round fall of grief in my belly, sudden onset wallow, a constant need to check the wind and lock the oven, the window, a fresh morning like linen shroud, baptism lights, I gush newness, I am a reservoir of water, so many said something wasn't right. The form asks if my favorite poet is Raymond Curtis, and do I enjoy stamp collecting? <laughs> I leave my hair near the mallows for the robins. The nurse with soft hands and kumquat fingers asks me to separate myself from sickness. This is how I go missing. This is my inheritance, all wet eyes scattered. Grandma cursed me with hope. I am so here. And uh, my last one is called Hypomania. And morning wilts into evening, and the fig tree is heavy with burden, and the chickadees got God in their mouths, and I come from swamp mallows, and I am one and a half flat rat, and the taste of tomorrow in my full lip quiver. And I tried sitting down, and it didn't agree with me, and the oak tree disguised itself as a chestnut tree, and the men next door have hooks for fingers and vacuums for eyes, and I have an inconveniently trembling hand, and I don't want to come back human. One time was enough. <laughs> has received fellowships from Kabe Kanem and New York University, was winner of the 2019 Best of the Net Prize, oh, a finalist for the 2019 Manchester Poetry Prize, and awarded the 2020 J. Howard and Barbara and J. Wood Prize from the Poetry Foundation. She is currently a visiting assistant professor of That's 
all you need to know. Cat nest seafood is simply placed in these and is about my factory. So, cat nest seafood for Uncle Kenny and Doug Deer. According to the local news station, the blue crawfish is a rare thing to find, yet it watches us from the tank of the market, spared from a boil of sleep and death, unlike his red friend. My uncle says joy is the opposite of running into a dagger, and I realize I am not the most poetic family member who has pain. Jay and I cracked the spines of the crawfish not lucky enough to be blue. The deeper the blue, the more I see black played above my head at the chiropractor the day before. Stubborn, I call my back. Supplication, the medical journal says. Three times a week, my chiropractor calls the forced removing of my misalignment a healthy crack. Like bullies, the emerging power, we look forward to making me almost great. I love my family, I like my back. Before we got here, Jay read Amber and Jade and Lappies into a necklace he made for me to match the cover of the book where I've written my name. He moves outside his box, newly freed. He loves movement. Says he understands that toxic masculinity means to want to pinch your claws around any smaller person. I am the third most poetic. <laughs> he loves the neon of the crawfish. We Google what makes it blue and we suck the sadness out of our conversation. Like luck, blues can spare any life if you bear it, but it will leave you as lonely as the crawfish in the tank. I wonder what family the mud bugs came from. Were they a proud bunch? Had the brightest shells in their swamp? Did this little blue bug love his looks or did he burrow deeper into the mud because he couldn't handle the attention? We chew the back meat of the unlucky things, stewed in the love that surrounds us like a pot with our spines and legs still attached. Look at what the brain makes the muscle do. Remember, joy is the membrane covering us, the tissue that keeps the family situated around the table when they could be running from one another. My uncle taps the murky glass to make the orphan thing move. He turns to us. Could you imagine us living like that? All hard on the outside of the no, no, I can't. There's so much in us to fall apart. Employee insurance, number one. 
Carolyn serves as poetry editor of the Fighting Voices from a blotted out planet tell her, I'm not her daughter. 
My mother calls to say she isn't dead, but OD on the ship. I stomp, I beat, I chew the bites. I feed my daughter what's so tough it won't go down. She read in French, who now reads phantom doodles on her bob. Miss Patty was my author. They call me mother, the loving bed that leads it to us. I sell science my bars. I save love for poems. I get wet. I see a craving wanna eat jelly when you write to me quickly when she is coming back. Students dissect the pearly tissue that held these bones. My cadaver. <laughs> rings. My mother calls to say she is dead. And Bristol. I'm right. I get down. <laughs> Especially with the, the word square poems, 
you can't, you get forced into that final word or the final two, you know, the final, the fourth or fifth word, it just forces itself out. It's the only thing that will work. It's backing you into a corner. Um, and so I think that that sort of loss of control with language, I think is a nice compliment to uh, our shared experience with um, addiction. And maybe I'll just add quickly also that I think of addiction and Christianity, um, they have shapes and forms themselves, right? Despite offering or promising possibility and freedom, um, they are innately formed and, and shaped. You, one becomes uh, contained in both of those things. Thank you. Uh, my next question is for Carolyn. Uh, dicte translates to dictation is the speaking or reading aloud of words for someone else to write down. It's a French word. More specifically, in French language instruction, dictes is when you listen to a French speaker or a recording, uh, and then you write down or type out what you are hearing. It is also a title of a book by Teresa Cha uh, named Dictate, uh, which is a monster book. If you've never read it, uh, totally worth your time. And that, that book deals with so much, uh, it deals so much with language and inherited stories. So given all of that, why that title for this poem? Um, I, I enjoy recycling titles that are already out there. Um, I think generally speaking, uh, a given human being produces too much poetry, uh, myself included. Um, so if something's already out there, I'm, I'm gonna grab it and, and try to grab onto it. Uh, so that's one reason. Um, the, it also, I feel self mocks a little bit with the law. Dick Day, it lowers it. I'm not fooling with Cha. I'm not even trying to get in that road. You know, it's one of my favorite books of all time. But I know that it can move us a little bit. At that and he goes in a completely other direction. It is a villain out You know, that's, that's one of the great migrant texts. The mother of all text. So I wanted to kind of tickle at it a teeny bit, but then with the law kind of back off of it. Um, I think the other thing I was going to say um, was that, uh, let me see, where is this? Um, with using a, a villanelle for dictation, French dictation, that interested me very much as far as having this kind of repeated repeating of the line, repeating of the language in order to attempt to learn and undo the thing. How that deals with uh, mental illness and the sort of, you know, obviously thematic repeats of the mother's calls, the mother's endless calling and calling and calling, even beyond the speaker's uh, own death. So, um, and dictate I find to be um, a defiant polyphonic text. Um, I also like stuff that's um, like Dia Powell's, uh, one of my favorite poems on illnesses. Tall and thin and, and young and lovely, but Michael with Kaposi Sarcoma goes uh, walking, which is, uh, can be sung to the tune of The Girl from Ipanema. Um, I love that. I love uh, Wanda Coleman's Wanda Warren Dead. Uh, Jay Lou Poplar's most recent book, While He's Dying, but it's still like, um, it's funny as hell in a lot of parts. So I really enjoy, especially with um, poetry that, that writes about mental illness, a little bit of derangement, um, something a bit distasteful, morbid. Uh, Lisa. Where and how does illness appear in your work? Rather, which approach to illness ruminates? Stories, narratives, uh, what I've witnessed, and it was humbling and really gratifying to get to learn my my elders as an adult. We love the position, but we don't know who we are. <laughs> and when you're grown and you interact and you hear what really happens at the and you see. But you saw them vibrant young, and then you see them age, and it's just such a lesson. So I try to capture those narratives, which was why I was in front of you 
catch the mountain when I walked. Because it wasn't his fault. He, it was, he was a victim of the crack at that time of the dream. It took a physical and psychological toll on him, unfortunately. So, the story. Um, in your poem, Cast Net Seafood, you elaborate on a conversation between your uncle and your cousin, saying, I'm the third most poetic person in my family, which is a great one. Uh, after they both remark on pain, what is the impact of writing your real family into your poems, especially when writing about your physical pain, which is so personal? Ooh, okay. That's a good question. I mean, I haven't really thought about it that much because I knew writing about illness in all forms. Um, well, maybe not. When I was looking through like, the book, I realized that some things make little cameo appearances, and now I understand you know, in more detail of what that could have been, could have been tied to my diagnosis or just other things. So when I was first writing home, I didn't really share with anybody. Like when my book came out, it was like the first time like, a big piece of my family like, actually heard my work. Besides like my mom, sensory element um, through language, I think, sets it up to just be more reminiscent of what that time was like. Uh, that then kind of, you start, you know, the idea of visions um, under sort of a, uh, in, in such a state. Mm -hmm. um, and I think that what we're really trying to do with this is just objectify the experience and, and, and put it outside of morality. Um, and so we kind of do push against that sort of really overarching <coughs> Christian framework that addiction is often put in, especially recovery, right? It's always sort of in that mode. So we're trying to really take that out. 
Would you, there's another kind of page quote that really, what was that one that you, um, just to completely make an outfit, right? Or, um, uh, what I'm trying, and this is what he says about the Masastic specifically, what I'm trying to do is to get our minds open so that people don't see things as being ugly or beautiful, but we see them just as they are, mm -hmm. um, which has been critical. Right, right. so that's, that's our JC. Right, it's not it's not Jesus Christ here. It's John Cage, and, and, so, and so what I'm saying. But, but no, all, all jokes aside, though, there is sort of an admirable quality to the idea of. Well, Carolyn's already opened the floor. I was going to say effed up, but the, really the, the quality of getting fucked up. All of humanity, since, since they can figure it out, has gotten fucked up. And really, what's at the root of that, though, is a desire to change the world, and, and for better or for worse. Now, when you sort of, you know, get these two worlds, you're getting fucked up, and you kind of you break them apart, well, addiction is when I think these worlds fully separate. And now there's only one thing in which can save the world, right? Well, then it becomes a matter of, like, well, what's, you know, s social systems of saying, well, what's a good addiction and what's a bad addiction? Somebody can be addicted to Christ, right, or Christianity. They can be addicted to God, but that's, that's no problem. That's okay. Um, it by well, you know, thank you. <laughs> but <laughs> right, but um, so I think working to reconcile, right? Like I think that just feels like a critical word. Working kind of to reconcile those objectives, those two understandings, historical presentations, and understandings of addiction with the models of recovery that are available to us, with the need and want to make art, with the need and want to believe in something. And also that it's sort of not really as lonely as it seems, right? I mean, it's sort of, there's all, everyone around the world, I mean, everybody's got coffee this morning. Everybody's, you know, some, some form of trying to get it together and make, make it tolerable. Make right? it tolerable. Yeah. And, and pushing, I mean, the, you want, and I'll close with this if I feel like I'm just going, but the, uh, the idea of an anonymous, right, addicted body, um, which is something you've said in the past, when we're talking about our project, feels really important. And then pushing up against, like the anonymous stereotypical addiction. Right? What can we learn from playing with that, or not, or unlearn? Um, I have a question for the whole group because you mentioned play. So I actually wrote this question for you all and for Lisa, but I think everyone on the panel, um, your work could be interpreted to some extent as playful. The form and the way you all read, Carolyn, the way you read, people were laughing, it's a very serious subject matter. Um, Charisma and Mona Lisa, you guys are weaving in family stories and sometimes funny quotes. And Mona Lisa specifically, you, you incorporate like actual play, sidewalk songs, um, but sidewalk songs and um, songs in general and things like that. So all of you have, have played differently today, but why is it important? Or why do you choose to play, especially when the subject matter is so serious? And I think we can open the floor for that. Yeah. I'm gonna make a joke just because I'm funny. No, people think, I mean, the title is tongue in cheek. I'm not always serious. <laughs> the title started because there are poems in the book that are called I'm Always So Serious, but it's because some people are like, oh, no, you're giving me an erection face. I'm like, oh, thank you. <laughs> you know, so it's just like, you know, sometimes it, it's, it's just like, it, it started very sarcastically tongue in cheek, but it's like, oh, there are things to be serious about, there are things that you know, people perceive that, you know, I'm serious about, which I'm really great feeling. And it could be, it's like, oh, you're me and I was like, oh, well, maybe you're not that great, then I'm just stay with it. So, for me, I think it's playful because music, uh, music also influences my work a lot, and um, although you can't really see, like, I have like a poem that's like, Box. I have some that like goes across the page, I have some that goes like down like this. I just think it's fun to take up as much space on the page as possible and be playful because there are so many like different types of poetry and forms that haven't even been like invented yet or even you know can't be contained on like paper. So I think it's important. I don't want to bore myself because if I bore myself, I feel like I would bore the reader. So for me, you know, with form, there's the same like form matching content. Sometimes when you're talking about heavy stuff, you do have to kind of balance that. Mm -hmm. But also that idea of playfulness, I just like to use different hands and be similar to uh, Dr. Saloy. Like I, um, yeah, I grew up with parents, they, they knew each other since like the third grade, so their friends um, were their friends.
friends. So it's just like you know, all of a sudden, like the main thing to um, ask how my parents, especially poets, because they, you know, it's a it's very like an oral tradition, and oral tradition is stories. The first poems are oral, so talking and then there's songs and then music, and then there's just um, I mean, we all people have different accents and dialects, so everything is playful. And in my case, my new book is called Black Riddle Chronicles. It's coming out at the end of May. And so it's our culture. It's our traditions. And it's eloquently put by charisma. It's who we are as a people and how we celebrate each day or mourn each day or build each other up or tear each other down. <laughs> it's how we lived and my observations and my experiences and their experiences and observations, which have informed my work and inspired my work. So for me, it's one and the same. And so I'm trying to, and last year, I was the honor of Poet Laureate. I taught 15 college classes and did over 50 speaking engagements going all over the state. And people kept asking me, well, who are thou? What's what? So the poems that came out of that were really replying to those questions. And so that's kind of how the, the collection evolved. It's trying to honor that. Questions, please come see us by our books. Um, talk to us and um, I don't know, be nice to each other, give each other hugs, read poetry. You're all amazing. Thank you so much for being here.